Well, good morning, everybody. Were you, were you doing the count down there? I was doing it in my head. I was doing 10. I should have got the kids involved. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Blast off. Good. Here we go. Well, good morning, everyone, and a, a very warm welcome to Rhymesbury Trinity Church this morning for our worship service. It's lovely to see you all on this glorious Sunday morning. Um, there's an old chorus uh, we used to sing, I'll praise God for the weather. Uh, and it's okay praising God when the weather's good, isn't it? But not so easy when the weather's the way it has been over winter. So no matter what the weather is, though, we still praise God, don't we? Good or bad. So welcome to you, those of you who are here. Welcome to those of you who are watching on the live stream. And we'll also maybe watch during the week uh, on our YouTube video, where you give you all a very warm welcome. Just after this service, uh, some intimations. Um, we read an, an edict last week. Uh, I'll read it again today. A special meeting will be held on Sunday, 6th of March, 2022, after morning worship. This special meeting of the trustees has been called to approve the financial accounts and reports to be presented at the annual business meeting by order of the Committee of Management. So immediately after this service, could the trustees just stay behind for a short period of time for that meeting? There are copies available. They're in the vestry at the moment, but they'll bring them through. If you don't have a copy yet, we'll make sure that you have a copy, uh, a hard copy. You should have received the other ones uh, by email during the week, so you, so you have a, an idea of what's in there. Um, the communion service is next Sunday. We look forward to that. Um, we announced last week that there would be a special collection which would go to the Church's Benevolent Fund. We've since had a change of thought on that, and the elders have agreed that the money should go to Ukraine rather than to a benevolent fund. We will carry forward to June the collection for the, for the benevolent fund. So. Uh, and rather than having the, the bags placed at the exits as we leave next week, we will be passing the bag round so there will be less confusion. Uh, just about a normal collection uplift uh, next Sunday. We feel we're safe enough now uh, for that to happen with regard to uh, COVID. Uh, the next meeting place uh, will be on Thursday, 17th of March. That's a week on Thursday. From 10.30 until 11.30, come for a coffee, a free, that should be enlarged, a free coffee and tea and a biscuit, and meet for a chat, and then a short devotional meeting together. I've also to give advance notice and invitation to you uh, and to give to others to come along with you on the three Sunday nights of Hope Explored, starting on Sunday 27th of March at 7 p.m. in the small hall. Hope Explored is an informal and relaxed three-week course. It's for anyone who wants to find hope, peace, and purpose in life. It's completely free. You don't need to know anything about the Bible. You won't be asked to pray or sing. You can ask any questions you like, or you can just sit and listen. Whoever you are, whatever you're thinking, Hope Explored is a place for you to discover the hope of a future that is better than you could ever imagine. So these are all the intimations for just now. Um, we are going to um, now have our, our call to worship, uh, which I'm going to do from memory today. So I'm chancing my arm. It may be that if I get stuck, I'll have to stop and look it up. It is simply reminding us at the start of the Easter period, one of my favorite Bible verses. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, as you bear that thought of everlasting life in mind, it's a wonderful privilege um, to, to sing our opening hymn, which is a mission praise, and it is, I have decided to follow Jesus. Let's stand to sing. Now, oh, you'll have noticed we have no uh, organist today. Kath, uh, not Kath. Oh, Kath, are you playing today? <laughs> um, Kirsty is unwell, 
Um, she's been diagnosed with COVID and is isolating at the moment. As far as I know, she's not too unwell, but we, we send our thoughts uh, to Kath. So we're going to stand and sing, and you're down to me starting you off, so please bear with us. OK, let's all stand. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back. No turning back Though none go with me I still will follow Though none go with me I still will follow Though none go with me I still will follow No turning back No turning back Will you decide now too bad, was it? Yeah. Okay, um, so, see the link between John 3 and 16 and the hymn we just sang. It's when we put our trust in Jesus and we decide to follow him. That's so important in a Christian life. Kath's going to come now and lead us in our opening prayer. Thank you, Kath. Let's all pray together. Good morning, Lord. It's us at Renfrew Trinity speaking and listening to you again. And week by week, we come before you in prayer and we worship you and praise your name. Sometimes on other days, we forget, Lord, it happens to us all, adults and children. And we would ask you to forgive us and to help us remember that you listen to prayer to you at any time at all and not only when we're gathered together on a Sunday. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our saviour and also our wonderful friend. We thank you for junior church boys and girls and for their leaders who prepare and share with them week by week, telling them about you through different activities and listening and talking to them. We remember, Lord, how important that is that they do listen to what the children have to say about their week and about maybe you and about friends and about maybe things that are concerning them or things that are making them very happy within their families and within their lives at school and other places. We thank you for the tireless work that the leaders do with them. They have fun too and that's also very important but all the time through the activities and through everything they're doing they're learning more and more about you. So thank you, Lord, and we remember the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples to say as we say it together. Our Father, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Kath. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you this morning? 
Thank you, Thomas. Glad somebody's giving me the thumbs up. What about the rest of you? Are you all right? Give us a smile. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> it's just where the camera's not on you. <laughs> you, you break the camera with a smile like that. Well done. John, John, when he, he's speaking to the grown ups later on, he's going to be speaking from 2 Corinthians, a book in the Old Testament. I don't know what John's going to be talking in the New Testament, sorry. I'm not sure what John's going to be saying to us for sure, but I know there are some very famous and very important verses in 2 Corinthians. And one of these comes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, where it says, If anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. When it says when anyone is in Christ Jesus, it means if anyone is a Christian and believes in Jesus as their saviour. But what does it mean when it talks about being a new creation? Have any of you, I'm sure you will, have heard of the Transformers? Have you heard of Transformers? What's the phrase that goes with them? Is there a phrase that goes with it? Transformers? Is it robots in disguise? Something like that. Uh, and and you, you even see them, there's television adverts about this now, aren't there? I think it's direct line, is it? Where the, uh, the Transformer is doing his utmost to get to the breakdown as quickly as possible, only to discover that the um, REC man or the AA man is there before him, and the Transformer is absolutely devastated and disgusted that somebody's beaten him to it. But anyway, this Transformer, maybe in the shape of a car, and all of a sudden you make a few changes and it transforms into something completely different, into a robot, doesn't it? Is that right? Okay. That's one example. Here's another one. Bear with me. Bit of paper. What can I transform this into, do you think? What? An aeroplane? I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you didn't say something too fancy. Otherwise, I'd have been in stuck, wouldn't I? So bear with me. Talk amongst yourselves for a minute. Right, what's the long? It doesn't take long, this. If you know what you're doing. Nearly there. <laughs> Don't hold your breath, though. Right, will it work? What way will I throw it? Somewhere safe? Because I don't want to poke anybody's eye out. How about over there? Ready? Not bad. It got at least four, four, three yards there. So transformed, created something new from an ordinary bit of paper into a wee aeroplane that flew for about nine feet. So what does the writer... It was Paul, a man called Paul, who wrote this letter, the Second Corinthians. What does he mean when he talks about someone being made into a new creation? Well, we've seen examples of things that change shape and become something new. We've got the transformers, we've got the bit of paper. There was a time in my life, many years ago, when God made me a new creation. Many other people in the church today have experienced the same change. We all look the same on the outside, but God has made us into a new person on the inside. We have asked Jesus to be our saviour and admitted to God that we get things wrong, don't we? Do we get things wrong sometimes, kids? Mm -hmm. We make mistakes. We don't reach the standards that God sets for us. This is because, you've heard of Adam and Eve? What did Adam and Eve do in the garden? They ate the apple they weren't supposed to eat. The one command that God gave them, they broke it. And by disobeying the one command that God had given them, man fell short of God's standards. I came to realize that. And I simply prayed to God and asked him to forgive me my sins because Jesus has made that possible. 
when I said that prayer. God made me a new creation. He changed me in the inside. As we look forward to Easter, it's going to be the Easter holidays, won't it? About four weeks away. As we look forward to Easter, we remember the Easter story of Jesus, God's Son, who bore the punishment for our sins at Calvary. What, did, what was the verse we read earlier? For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Will you think about asking God to make you a new creation? You see, the Bible tells us that we all look in the outward appearance. When we look at each other, we all look great, don't we? Don't we? We all look great. But God looks in our hearts. And although we might look great on the outside, like the powerful transformers, God sees our hearts. He sees our thoughts. When mum and dad or granny and granddad or our guardians ask us to do something, and we can't be bothered doing it. He sees our thoughts when we get angry at someone or we get jealous of the things that they have and that we want but don't have. Now here's a leading question for you. And be kind to me. How do I look today on the outside? (laughs) Get the thumbs up again. Good. But there's something not quite right. You can't see what it is, but there's something not quite right. I was actually waiting and people noticing earlier on as I was walking about the church, but no one said to me yet. Is that a sock? Not the same as that sock. <laughs> See, it looks fine on the outside, but actually it's not too good when you look underneath the skin and see there's something not quite right there. That's the way it is when God looks at us. He sees those wee things that aren't quite right. And he wants to make them better for us. So with all of that in mind, we're going to stand and sing our next song before the children go out to junior church. And the next song is, I Am a New Creation. Let's all stand to sing. I am, no, that's too high. I am a new creation, no more in condemnation, here in the grace of God I stand. My heart is overflowing, my love just keeps on growing, here in the grace of God I stand. And I will praise you, Lord, yes, I will praise you, Lord, and I will sing of all that you have done. A joy that knows no limit, a likeness in my spirit, here in the grace of God I stand. Thank you. Time now for um, the Bible reading, which Anne is going to do today. Thank you, Anne. Today's Bible reading is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, reading verses 1 to 14, uh, found in page 1158. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all the saints throughout Achaia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, 
so also through Christ our Comforter overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffer in the province of Asia. We are under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, our hearts, in, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in the answer to the prayers of many. Now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations with you, in the holiness and sincerity that are from God. We have done so not according to worldly wisdom, but according to God's grace. For we do not write to you anything we cannot read or understand. And I hope that, as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us just as we boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. May God add his blessing to his holy word. Amen. Thank you, Anne. <coughs> now time for our next prayer. Uh, Cass, going to lead us in prayer again. Thank you, Cass. Let's come together once more in prayer to the Lord. Lord, you could hear David speaking to you there, speaking to the children, speaking to us, and reminding us of our hearts. And it's good, it's good, Lord, to have fun in your presence. And also we realise that you know that our hearts are heavy, heavy with what is going on, in your world. Many, many different things, Lord, obviously. For everyone, our hearts are with the people in Ukraine. They're also with other people in other countries. And this morning, Lord, just, um, I read in, in their daily bread, as I'm sure lots of others did, it's a wee booklet that some of us read, um, spoke of experiencing tongue-tied in prayer describing being at a loss for words and not knowing what to say. But together with countless others, although our hearts are heavy, Lord, with the, these concerns and with particularly the concern for Ukraine at the moment, we thank you, Father, that we can come to you in prayer and that you are listening to every whispered prayer from all over the world. Lord, there are many aid agencies working in other countries also bringing love and practical help and these are also people who are sharing the gospel your love with people that they meet and many of them are working in hard tough places please father continue to guide them we remember as we pray that you understand the personal needs of them even when we don't we praise you god that the internet and other technologies are providing the gospel to people in many places seeking the truth the truth of your word the truth of your son thank you lord for the many chat rooms and for those who staff them particularly over these last couple of years when people couldn't meet face to face prayer changes things you lord change things and it's a powerful challenge to us every day to continue praying to you 
We also think of our own congregation who are perhaps concerned for family going through difficult times or maybe hospital admissions or tests, etc. We bring them before you, Lord. We pray for people listening to this service also online who have concerns for others and perhaps for themselves. You are our loving God and you care for us and what a privilege it is to come before you. We would ask for your blessing on John as he brings us your message that we may listen and learn from it. You know, Lord, that there was a World Day of Prayer held yesterday, just as the word says, world, all over the world, different venues, and one of the hymns sung was, Christ, be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ, be our light, shine in your church, gathered today. Amen. Thank you very much, Kath. Now, just before John comes to speak to us and makes his way up to the, the pulpit, I will sing our, our next hymn, uh, which is Teach Me Thy Way, O Lord. Yes, I'll stand. Just a bit very briefly, the reason I've chosen this is because 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says this. Um, we live by faith, not by sight. Bear that in mind as we sing, Teach me thy way, O Lord. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Teach me thy way. Thy gracious aid afford. Teach me thy way. Help me to walk aright, more by faithless by sight. Lead me with heavenly light, teach me thy way. Teach me when doubts and fears arise, teach me thy way. When storms o'erspread the skies, teach me thy way. Shine through the cloud and rain, through sorrow, toil and pain. Make thou my pathway plain, teach me thy way. Long as my life shall last, teach me thy way. Whatever my lot be cast, teach me thy way. Until the race is won, until the Good morning, and it's, uh, it's very interesting to me, when I'm um, speaking from here, from the pulpit, you know, it's a strange thing because, like, as I'm speaking, I can hear myself teaching myself, <laughs> you know, so I often think that I'm out here deliberating and delivering to you, I'm speaking of what I have learned. And it teaches me. <clears throat> so, uh, as we all know that uh, Trinity Church is recovering from recent months of lockdown, we all know that. It's just beginning to get on its feet. And now we need to be thinking of the future here and asking questions like, how do we begin to grow? 
And uh, our denomination is about to begin a process of reforming and reorganizing after long years of general decline in church growth uh, and church going. And there's no doubt that the question of the day for the church is, how do you build a church after a time of setback? And our reading today came from second letter of Paul to the church at Corinth. And there is no doubt that as we heard the reading that this was a church that was built despite troubles before it was even begun. And there were troubles before it was begun, troubles of a sort during its beginning and troubles after it was first established. And yet Paul said of them, our hope for you is firm. And they would be Paul's boast in the day of the Lord. So let's look into God's Word and the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, a church in recovery after setback, and see what the Lord might have to say to us in our time today. On his second missionary journey, Paul came to Corinth, and we remind ourselves how, this, how these missionary journeys began. It's in Acts chapter 13, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So it was through prayer that the Holy Spirit gave directions. So the first journey began, and it was a spiritual work for God. Now here is Paul in his second missionary journey, and he left Athens and arrived at Corinth. It was the capital city of the province of Achaia, a large island nearly as big as Sicily is, just off the Greek mainland. And the letter is addressed to Corinth and all Achaia. And the letter shows how many Christians uh, must have been spread about on the island beyond Corinth. But when Paul arrived, there was no Christians on the island. He began with the synagogue people, reasoning and persuading. And after disputes over if Jesus was the Messiah, he was rejected from the synagogue. So he taught the Greek people. And he took quarters in a house beside the synagogue and he conducted mission for 18 months and spread out all over the island. And this concept was first taught by Jesus when he said to his disciples, I will make you fishers of men. And Jesus also taught the parable about the invitation to the feast. If you remember it, um, people wouldn't come to the feast. So the master sent his servants out into the streets to invite people to come. Some folk did come, but still there was room. And so the master sent his, servant, his servants out a second time. Now, repeating is uh, using, uh, repeating this method is to double down on it, showing it is a principle to be adopted. Then Paul left and he stayed at Ephesus for the next two years, and soon he received information of trouble at Corinth, errors of bad conduct and selfishness out of a lack of Christian love. And they criticized Paul, and they doubted if he was a true leader. Bullies emerged, demanding obedience to them. So Paul wrote a letter to Corinth and Achaia Island. And we don't know the full contents of the letter because it is lost to history. But it is known that 1 Corinthians was written as episode 2. And it was needed to clear up the misunderstandings from the first letter. And as it turns out, things weren't sorted yet by these letters. So Paul returned on a short visit to Corinth. And this is known as the painful visit and it didn't go well for Paul. So he left and returned to Ephesus. And from there, he wrote a third letter to, a severe letter to Corinth. And this was taken to Corinth by Titus, who was a fellow worker with Paul. Now the severe letter is also lost, but we do know that it brought about a complete change for the good. Paul was overjoyed about it when he got the news from Titus on his return. And this proves to us that the Holy Spirit will or can use literature to communicate as well as discussing with people, teaching and preaching. Anyway, 
The troublesome leaders at Corinth had been removed from office, although some grumblers remained in the church. And it was at this point that Paul wrote the letter we know as 2 Corinthians. Paul writes of his great love for the church and asks uh, that ring, ring, the ringleaders would be welcomed in the love of Christ. And he also explained how he had written the letters in tears, in much anguish, which is an interesting snapshot. And now we know the background. Let's look at the synopsis of 2 Corinthians. The letter itself is made up of small packages of teaching strung throughout the narrative. Chapter 1 has thankfulness for being reconciled. 2 concerns the stubbornness of the remaining opposition. 3 to 6 contain many theological reflections. 6 and 7 are said to include a few elements of the previous letters. 7 rejoices at the church's repentance. 8 and 9 changes subject to talk about a welfare fund for the Christians at Jerusalem who were in poverty due to persecution. And chapters 10 to 13 have a different mood because they seem to hark back to a more severe tone. And so some Bible scholars tend towards the view that the last three chapters might be a sort of addendum that was attached and contains however much of the first letter and the severe letter you care to read into it. And this is a debate amongst all the scholars. Paul was criticized for his style of speaking. In those days, in ancient Greece, people were taught public speaking. Boys started at 14 years of age and learned about persuasion and manipulating folk and their ideas. And there was correct ways to deliver a speech. They learned how to use emotions in order to persuade. And the Apostle Paul, however, did not fit into the public speaking mold of rhetoric. The complaint of his critics was, he can't, he can't even speak right. And in this letter, Paul writes about his ministry style. And we can pick up insights about speaking for Christ. He wrote, We have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul prayed about everything as he went, and his prayers were very detailed too. His prayers are written all through his uh, other letters, and here's an example from Colossians chapter 4. Continually, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door to speak the mystery of Christ. And when he says the mystery of Christ, he's referring to all the information about Christ that was sort of concealed in the Old Testament and is now open to the world. And his, his prayer was that I may make it clear as I ought to speak. His prayers are an example to us. And because of his prayers, he could say, we have such trust through Christ toward God. Now, Paul knew uh, what it was to walk in faith and prayer, even when experiencing trouble and difficulties. He wrote, we are not sufficient in ourselves to think of anything as being of ourselves. And he said, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. <clears throat> he describes the law of Moses as being the ministry of condemnation. And I would emphasize that. He describes the law of Moses as the ministry of condemnation. And to me, this means we are condemned by the law. That's its purpose. So don't be like pernickety lawyers, nitpicking over words and principles of legality, but be led by God's Holy Spirit who brings life to the words of Scripture. And he describes the message of the gospel, on the other hand, as the ministry of reconciliation. And I would emphasize that, the ministry of reconciliation. Paul asks, won't the ministry of the Spirit be more glorious than it was when Moses received the Ten Commandments? 
And that was glorious enough. He wrote, We have such trust through Christ towards God in chapter 3. And as I see it, what is happening during mission is this. All those who have themselves experienced God's reconciliation, that back together with God effect, they cannot keep silent and must tell about it. All reconciled Christians have this ministry of reconciliation to others. And Paul goes on, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. And I understand it to be like this. Having our faith in God, we are directed by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are bold in what we say, bold in what we do, and the Spirit gives life. Paul's method was not to use rhetorical, emotional persuasion like they do in Greek rhetoric, but to simply speak of what we believe from the Scriptures. Paul writes about a psalm saying, It is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore speak. And I would note that this includes all Christians and it is not only for church leaders. We also believe and therefore we should speak. And Paul puts it another way. Chapter 5, he says, We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now that big word, reconciled, simply means bring back together. The people uh, in the Christian church have the work of ministering, the ministry of reconciliation. And we should understand our work to be like this. God pleads with people who do not believe through what we say, backed up by how we live with integrity, and that is evangelism. The Holy Spirit prompts you and has you take the ministry of back together with God from out of within church walls, out into the community, outside who do not yet believe. This is how you build a church after a time of trouble, by taking the message out among non-believers out into the community where we live. And then one day we might write over Trinity Church what is written in the Acts of the Apostles. And the Lord added to their number daily those being saved. Paul wrote this in chapter 10. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And as I see it, that's the purpose that succeeds in mission. Paul wrote in chapter 2, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. And we read about a good illustration of this in Acts chapter 17 that Paul came to Thessalonica and he reasoned with the people from the Scriptures explaining and demonstrating about Jesus. And some of them were persuaded, including a large number of devout Greeks and a number of leading women who joined Paul and Silas. It was hard and dangerous work traveling in those days. Paul could write, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. In 2 Corinthians, like no other letter, Paul is very open about the difficulties. Three times he was sure he was going to die. But over and over again, he could not stop. And why was that? He explains, the love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ for people who are lost in life, without God, or knowing God's love for them in Jesus. It is the love of God that constrains us, compels us, forces us to want to go on the mission trail ourselves, or it should do. And as I bring our thoughts to a conclusion, we know and understand that we don't convince people into the kingdom of heaven ourselves. Jesus is the gate of the sheepfold, and not any man or woman. His, the Jesus, 
is a spiritual work, a spiritual activity. The calling of men and women is for, is for Him. And as the old hymn says, in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a power in His bosom that transfigures you and me. Paul writes in chapter 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ. It is a spiritual work. And that is the people who make up the church. And they are out there in the community. And they don't believe yet. They don't believe today. But we must tell them. For the love of Christ compels us, forces us, or should do. Some denominations of the church have adopted another model of church growth, which is church families based. It goes something like this. Church parents have church children who grow up to be church parents themselves. And they have church children. And the cycle continues. Generation after generation. It has the appearance of sustaining growth. But it doesn't work long term. Because eventually, families stop coming to church. Much better is the Jesus-led, Holy Spirit model of growth based upon prayer where reconciled believers go out into the streets wherever they circulate and invite people to the Master's Feast, explaining about Jesus and His death and resurrection and what it means for people, all motivated by the love of Christ which compels them to do the work. So, just as we conclude, what about our time? Well, what about now? Well, you can get involved in explaining the message of Jesus. For example, you can join in with Hope Explored. Make a start there. And if you don't feel equipped to share your faith like I don't, the Hope Explored people have a separate teaching program called Passion for Life. And that teaches the basics of how to share your faith with others. I'm going to be watching their YouTube videos over the next few weeks. And if you would like more details, see me at tea after the service. So in time, to call it the by and by, we will meet with our dear Lord Jesus face to face. And there's an old song, an old hymn. You might know it. By and by, when I look in his face, beautiful face, thorn shadowed face. By and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more. More. So much more. More of life's trophies for him to adore. By and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more. And when I first heard that many years ago, it had a big impact on me. So, we're finishing. In answer to the question, how do you build a church after a time of trouble? Today we have learned from 2 Corinthians, we who are reconciled to God through the cross of Jesus, we who have ourselves experienced the ministry of reconciliation, we are become ministers of reconciliation ourselves now. The back together with God effect. And the love of Christ constrains us, compels us. We believe and therefore we speak of what we know in a spiritual work of God. We pray and are directed and prompted by the Holy Spirit. We speak and act boldly in the sight of God and our Savior Jesus. We leave the church family model of church growth for the Holy Spirit-inspired model of personal evangelism out in the community. It is um, now time for um, our closing hymn. And uh, we have a, an old mission anthem. And the title is, We've a Story to Tell to the Nations. And we'll see how we go singing that. <laughs> okay. Now, the interesting thing, carry on, David. The interesting thing about this anthem is, 
you can hide behind we. The words of the anthem are, we've a story to tell to the nations. You can hide behind we, but you can't hide behind you. So, today we have a world premiere of the new adaptation. And it says, it's the Renfrew version, and it begins, you've a story to tell throughout Renfrew that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy. A story of peace and light because it is the ministry of reconciliation. So, let us sing. Just, yeah, right. Keep going. Keep going, David. Just keep going. Sing here. Yeah. darkness must turn to a dawning and the dawning to noonday bright and Christ's great kingdom shall come to their hearts the kingdom of love and light you've a song to be sung through a trend through that shall turn their hearts to the Lord, a song that shall conquer worry and shatter contempt of God, and shatter contempt of God. For their darkness must turn to a dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom come into their hearts, the kingdom of love and light. You've a song. No, we've lost a verse. Hold on until it comes up. You've a message to give through a trend through that the Lord that reigneth above has sent us his Son to save us and show us that God is love and show us that God is love for the darkness must turn to a dawning and the crowning to noonday bright and Christ's great kingdom come into their hearts the kingdom of love and light you've a saviour to show throughout and through who the path of sorrow has trod that all of our towns many peoples might come to the truth of God, might come to the truth of God. For the darkness must turn to a dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom coming into their hearts, the king.